right, good afternoon, and welcome to the eighth episode of uh, the Arab Identity. Today, we are honored to have Professor Said Khan again. We're going to be speaking about the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government in 1917 during the First World War, announcing support for the establishment of a, quote, national home for the Jewish people, end quote, in Palestine. It was then an Ottoman region with a small minority of Jewish population. It was 93% Palestinians. The declaration was contained in a letter dated on November 2nd, 1917, from the United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to Lord Rothschild, a leader of the British Jewish community for transmission to the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. The text of the declaration was published in the press on November 9th, 1917. Immediately following their declaration of war in the Ottoman Empire in November 1914, the British War Cabinet began to consider the future of Palestine. With two months, uh, a memorandum was circulated to the cabinet by a Zionist cabinet member, Herbert Samuel, who is the father of the Balfour Declaration proposing the support of Zionist ambitions in order to enlist the support of Jews in the wider war. A committee was established in April 1915 by British Prime Minister uh, Asquith to determine the, their policy towards the Ottoman Empire, including Palestine. Asquith, who had favored post-war reform of the Ottoman Empire, resigned in December 16. His replacement, David Lloyd George, favored partition of the empire. The first negotiations between the British and the Zionists took place at the conference on February 7, 1917, that included Sir Mark Sykes and the Zionist leadership. Subsequent discussions led to Balfour's request on 19th of June that Rothschild and Shyam Wiseman submit a draft of a public declaration. Further drafts were discussed by the British cabinet during September and October, with a lot of Jewish uh, opposition to it. Uh, who were anti-Zionists, and it ended up with the final draft uh, that was, uh, by late 1917, it was uh, basically accepted by the uh, parliament. The, the release of the final declaration was authorized on October 31st. The preceding cabinet discussion had referenced perce perceived propaganda benefits amongst the worldwide Jewish community for the Allied war effort. I will uh, try not to uh, uh, talk a lot in the introduction so we can maximize the time uh, with Professor uh, Khan. Uh, Professor Said Khan, uh, this is the second time he appears with us in the Arab Identity Program. He's a senior lecturer in the departments of Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, where he teaches Islamic and Middle East history, politics and culture, and global issues, and where he also is the director of the Global Studies and a fellow at the Center uh, for the Study of Citizenship. In addition, he is a founding member and a senior research fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, a Michigan-based think tank promoting the study and analysis of U.S. social and domestic policy. Mr. Khan's publication include his upcoming anthology, Global Studies, a Reader on Issues and Institutions, and his recently published co-authored book, What's Going On Here? U.S. Experiences of Islamophobia Between Obama and Trump. Welcome again, Professor Khan. Thank you so much for having me on again, Hussam. So the, the uh, Belfort Declaration, uh, Professor uh, Ali Alawi from Oxford University, who is now, by the way, the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq and the Minister of Finance, <clears throat> he said in his book, Faisal I, probably no other declaration in modern times has had such an impact on entire peoples, has been so mired in controversy and has had such astounding consequences. Would you agree with Professor Alawi? Uh, I think that it has certainly had a very profound impact on the perceptions that people have. Uh, it is seen as a uh, a victory, a culmination of 2,000 years of aspiration for the Jewish people. It is seen as the ultimate act of betrayal uh, for the Arab people. And uh, like in most other situations, uh, there is, of course, truth. Uh, 
and there is a misperception about it. Uh, perhaps what's also very important, though, is to realize that the Balfour Declaration itself, as you had rightly said in your introduction, has a history. Uh, and it's a history that involves uh, two different narratives. One is the narrative of Jewish nationalism, uh, particularly that which uh, emerged in Europe, uh, which we now know um, as Zion, modern Zionism. Uh, and the other, of course, is, uh, as we talked about uh, in the last episode, the designs and the ambitions that European powers had uh, during and uh, with the eventual uh, conclusion of World War I of what to do with the Ottoman Empire, both for their uh, imperial and colonial uh, interests, uh, as well as uh, to uh, deal with some serious mistrust that these European powers had one another. So I think that's probably the best starting point uh, to then understand the full scope and scale of Balfour uh, well beyond just uh, what it did to uh, this uh, particular uh, geographic area between the, uh, the Mediterranean and the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Right, so in last episode, the professor in episode number seven, we spoke about the birth of uh, Zionism here on Arab identity. And today we want to talk a little bit more because it's uh, the Balfour Declaration is uh, um, a, 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 it was born from the womb of uh, of uh, political Zionism. Um, so uh, a, a question for you, uh, Herzl's uh, Zionism. It, it seems that Zionism that has developed in Eastern Europe as a response to Enlightenment. It seems it is in opposition of the of of Herzl, who was himself considered one of those who are enlightened and secular Jews. Um, but then, um, and he was more as a, of a territorialist <laughs> rather than a, a Zionist. And now we bring the term Zionism and him him as a founder of Zionism. That's it. It brings some confusion to the understanding of Zionism. How can we distinguish these things? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, realize that modern Zionism is, as you said, a very European phenomenon. Uh, Jews that were living uh, either uh, in Muslim territory or Muslim lands, whether it was the Ottoman Empire, whether it was in Syria, uh, whether it was in North Africa, that aspiration for a kind of territorial uh, uh, nationalism did not really exist. It's important to remember, as you said, that the Jewish community in Palestine uh, during the Ottoman era, uh, era was actually very small. Uh, the vast majority of Jews uh, in the Ottoman Empire lived elsewhere. They lived in Salonika, uh, they lived in Izmir, they lived in Istanbul, and they were predominantly Sephardic uh, Jews, those that had been rescued by Sultan Bayezid II uh, after the fall of uh, Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain in 1492 when he sent ships to rescue both uh, Jews and Muslims. Uh, who then were given refuge in uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And despite the fact that they could have conceivably moved within the Ottoman Empire to Palestine, they chose not to. Uh, it was simply not considered to be as, uh, as important or as commercially vital uh, as other parts of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. Now, within European Zionism, though, it's important to realize that there were two different trajectories. The enlightened Zionism uh, of which you speak was really a Western phenomenon. Uh, this emanates from Jews who were living in European capitals like Vienna and Berlin and Paris and in London. And here what we find is that the dynamics of uh, secularism and the dynamics of the political climate of, of Europe gave Jews a choice. If they wanted to uh, be uh, enfranchised, they had the opportunity to do so. Uh, they could live as essentially full citizens. They could have upward mobility, uh, but there was a price to pay. They had to check their Judaism at the front door before they left entering the public sphere. And it is because of this that we see then that some of the most prominent Jewish names that we know today historically uh, from Europe in this period, in fact, left Judaism. Uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who was the founder of the British Conservative Party, uh, Queen Victoria's favorite prime minister, uh, was in fact uh, 
uh, someone who converted to the Church of England through his family. Karl Marx uh, also converted to Protestant Christianity. Uh, he may have, of course, then um, assumed uh, atheism. But this idea of uh, de-Judification within the homes of so many prominent Jews in these areas was a decision that was made in order to then gain acceptance within, within broader society. That was actually not an option available to Jews that were farther to the east in Russia and in Ukraine. There, uh, the Jews uh, were uh, essentially subject to persecution. Uh, they would live in uh, small communities, many of them in agricultural areas. There was always a suspicion about them. And they were subject to these mass campaigns of discrimination and persecution known as pogroms. And one of the largest ones that occurred was in 1882. And oftentimes these happened when there was some way to try to deflect uh, attention away from either the corruption or the, um, the irresponsible uh, acts and policies of the czar. And so we find then that that was not a kind of Zionism that could necessarily emerge uh, out of what we would consider to be enlightenment philosophy. It was not available to them. And also many of the Jews that came from uh, that part of Europe uh, came from agricultural backgrounds, uh, came from rural backgrounds, whereas the ones from Western Europe were coming from urban centers. 1894 proved to be a watershed year, though, for the Jews of Western Europe. Now, as I said, many of them felt that if we provide ourselves to be secular, the great promise of enlightenment uh, theory in Europe as it was practiced, then we would be accepted as anybody else would be accepted. Those who chose to maintain their Jewish identity more uh, profoundly uh, ghettoized themselves, lived as Orthodox Jews uh, in these kinds of uh, communities, whether it was in Warsaw or in uh, in Krakow or elsewhere, even in some of these uh, other European cities. So this was a choice that was made. But it was a captain in the French Legion by the name of Alfred Dreyfus, who then uh, was uh, hit with the reality and with him, the entire Jewish community in Western Europe, that no matter how secular you can be, no matter how you present yourself, it isn't enough. He had risen to the rank of captain, a very prominent position within the military corps, and yet that didn't spare him from the accusation of passing military secrets to the German embassy in Paris. He was then charged with high treason, he was convicted completely on these bogus charges, uh, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment and the French penal colony in Devil's Island near French Guyana in South America. And the ease by which French society seemed to think, okay, well, because he's Jewish, he, he must have done something, this whole idea of where there's smoke, there must be fire really troubled a, a journalist by the name of Emile Zola, a writer and journalist. And he saw the way that the French were carrying themselves as being somewhat enlightened and liberal in their views and tolerant. And he then wrote a series of letters um, in Le Mans called uh, J'accuse, I Accuse You, in which he essentially indicted French society of allowing this miscarriage of justice to occur. And it then served as a jolt uh, by which then French society then created enough of a clamor that uh, Dreyfus was then uh, granted a new trial. At the trial, he was found uh, to have, uh, he was let go uh, uh, based on an insufficient evidence, but it took a decade before he was then fully exonerated of saying that the charges should never have been brought in the first place. But that served as a wake up call to uh, Jews in Western Europe and Herzl's very famous book, uh, Der Judenstaat, was until then seen as something more aspirational. The Jewish state, yes. The Jewish state. And in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland, at the World Zionist Congress, the ideas of Herzl, based on the treatment or the mistreatment of uh, Dreyfus and his experience, then served as catalyst to say that the only way that Jews could really be safe is if they had the self-determination. Now, of course, both... Uh, uh, Herzl, as well as uh, the rest of uh, the Jewish community that was now affected, those that were in Basel, were highly influenced by 
uh, what was now the zeitgeist in Europe, the ideas of European nationalism, something which had come out of the Protestant Reformation, had come out of the Thirty Year Wars, had come out of the Peace of Westphalia, the ideas of realigning oneself in a sovereign state based on a common nationality, and that nationality being a function of ethnicity or race or religion or culture or language. So it's important to then understand that how Z modern Zionism is in many ways a form of European nationalism, but European nationalism has its seeds in a sort of a very Christian narrative, which then of course makes modern Zionism problematic because it was not organically from within a Jewish narrative. You don't really see this happening, but Zionism then is added uh, to give it the kind of um, uh, narrative within uh, the Jewish uh, community to say that there is also a religious element to this and one which ties the Jewish people historically as well as religiously to Palestine. Professor, why did Herzl use the word Zionism, although at that time it didn't really represent what he's thinking? Well, it was a it was a compelling idea. Again, now we're we're dealing with Europe in the 19th century where isms were being tacked onto everything. And as a result of it, in order to give it its specificity and for uh recruitment purposes and for context purposes for the Jewish community, it needed to have something to which they could relate. And remember, the idea of an aspirational homeland for the Jewish people was developing as anywhere else but Europe. And ideas were even being uh, bandied about about uh, East Africa, including Uganda, yeah. uh, also uh, uh, South America. But now we find that there was uh, not as much of a, an allure. People couldn't relate to South America. They couldn't relate to Uganda because there was no uh, connectivity uh, historically, the way that, of course, uh, establishing uh, a homeland in uh, Palestine would then have uh, allowed it to occur. So in order for it to resonate with uh, the Jewish community, which, again, was either indifferent uh, or uh, certainly through the anti-Zionist movement, demonstrating still quite a bit of reluctance about it. This was a way to then gain enough support because the Zionist movement realized that if they were going to make the case, they would have to make that case to the European powers. And they could only do so if they could demonstrate that there was a sufficient amount of support for it from within the Jewish community. Do you, do you feel that Zionism as a project uh, as envisioned by uh, Herzl, was actually hijacked and it became something that he did not intend intended to be? Well, I mean, it depends on how we then look at Zionism. It, it's certainly not a monolithic uh, uh, concept. Uh, and I like the fact that you call it a project because what it then suggests is that it's ever evolving. Uh, there are at least four different strains to Zionism that we can talk about. We can talk about a kind of cultural Zionism, a political Zionism, a historical Zionism, and a theological Zionism. I mean, it's, it's without doubt that uh, Jews historically, with uh, maintaining a connection to uh, the, the land, uh, during their Passover seders will take a toast and say next year in Jerusalem. And of course, for hundreds upon hundreds of years, uh, this was done more pro forma as a kind of symbolic statement. Uh, I, I suppose as some people uh, even uh, facetiously say when Muslims say inshallah, <laughs> about whether how much intentionality is really behind that. Uh, because it was certainly not something that they could have realized. Uh, but again, when we're looking at how the evolution of something from an abstract idea to operation uh, plays out. Herzl could never have imagined all of the steps that would have then triggered the possibility of uh, a state of Israel uh, occurring and for the fulfillment of his idea of Zionism and uh, all of the different uh, forces that were at play. In many ways, interestingly and ironically enough, as uh, Karl Marx's ideas in, uh, in uh, Das Kapital and in uh, the Communist Manifesto, he had an idea about what would happen with um, class uh, exploitation, <laughs> modes of production, his critique of capitalism and uh, uh, industrialization. 
would he have been able to have predicted, would he have wanted to have uh, a totalitarian state like the Soviet Union occur? Uh, I'm sure Marx would have probably been mortified by that idea. And Herzl probably similarly would have been uh, highly critical of some of the ways that Zionism has been um, uh, leveraged uh, by those who uh, claim to be speaking and acting in its name. In 1897, he held the first Jewish Congress. By, 18, by, by 1903, six year, in the sixth Jewish conference, when he presented Uganda for the conference, and they rejected it, and they you know, accused him, and they almost kicked him out of the conference. Uh, isn't that the person who have lost control of his project? Well, very much so. And, and it's not unusual for those who are the, uh, the ideators, so to speak, uh, to be kicked out by the technocrats. And clearly, I think, as you rightly show, that by the Sixth uh, World Zionist Congress, uh, there were people who now had been highly motivated, uh, and now they wanted to create and craft Zionism in their own image. And we see this happening um, as very much an internal struggle within, uh, within the Jewish movement and within the Zionist movement. Case in point, two of the most prominent uh, Zionists and uh, arguably two of the most influential within um, uh, modern uh, Jewish history uh, came from the East. They did not come from Western Europe. Uh, these include uh, the eventual first prime minister of uh, Israel, David Ben-Gurion, and the other is uh, Vladimir uh, or Zev Jabotinsky, who has served as a uh, very much a guiding voice for particularly uh, uh, the uh, right of center uh, Jewish movement in, in Israel. Both of them showed up in Salonika uh, trying to recruit uh, the Jewish community in Salonika for their project of Zionism. And they approached who they thought would be a natural ally. Uh, the head of the biggest uh, labor union there who happened to be uh, a Jewish man by the name of Avraham ben uh, Aroya, uh, except he was a Sephardic Jew. And he and his family had been living in uh, Salonika for centuries. And when they came to try to uh, get his aid to marshal the Jewish community of uh, Salonika and its resources, because they were quite well to do uh, as merchants, many of them, uh, Ben Oroya um, refused. And he rejected their calls for Zionism because he said, look, this is stirring up the pot unnecessarily. We lead a perfectly uh, uh, stable, secure, and safe life here. Uh, and in fact, uh, doing this may then jeopardize and undermine the Ottoman Empire, something that doesn't serve our purposes very well. And the last thing that Ben Oroya uh, opposed uh, uh, Ben Gurion and uh, Jabotinsky about was that they were too bourgeois for him. Uh, here was the leader of a, a labor movement, and he says, you know, we don't need a bunch of elitists coming in and trying to dictate uh, how we should live our lives and try to appeal to us just based on our Jewishness. I mean, these are fascinating uh, elements uh, to uh, see how complicated uh, yeah. Zionism was in its uh, development. The reason, uh, Doctor, and we've spent some time on this, uh, on this, because it's it is related to Balfour Declaration. It's actually related also to uh, the environment uh, back then. That uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, read a, a little uh, passage by uh, Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence, who, if anyone can represent the Arab Revolt, who is not uh, from it, um, or. Uh, a British uh, to represent the Arab revolt, it would be Lawrence. He said, you know, of course, the root difference between Palestine, the between the Palestine Jew and the colonist Jew to Faisal, the important point is that the former speak Arabic and the later German Yiddish. He is in touch with the Arab Jews, their headquarters at Safad and Tiberias and, and his sphere, and they are ready to help him on conditions. They the Arabic-speaking Jews, show a strong antipathy to the colonist Jews and have even suggested repressive measures against them. Faisal has ignored this point hitherto and will continue to do so. His attempts to get in touch with the colonial Jews have not been very fortunate. They say they have made arrangements with the great powers and wish no contact with the Arab party. 
Now, Faisal wants to know what is the arrangement standing between the colonist Jews, called Zionists sometimes, and the Allies? What have you promised the Zionists, and what is their program? Now, that is in early 1917, Lawrence addressing the uh, British uh, Commission. Um, so there was no clarity as far as uh, the Arabs about the concept of Zionism because uh, Zionism, it presented itself in different shapes and forms at that, at that point. Um, the people who have uh, um, uh, discussed the Balfour Declaration in the parliament, they also had different per perceptions of it. Uh, that's why there were a lot of revisions of the text because uh, the people were interpreting it in different ways. Uh, there is this uh, unclarity about the Zionist project because it was, it's either one of two things, uh, Professor, in, in, my, you know, in my perception, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's either that uh, uh, Herzl wanted to uh, recruit people using the uh, term Zionism and uh, basically... Uh, it continued that way for the sake of recruitment, for the sake of solidarity. Um, or there was actually a plan to undermine uh, Zionism with the, with the uh, we can call it the, the colonial Zionism, uh, as it proceeded into, uh, into, uh, um, into its political objectives. And when Wiseman met Faisal in, uh, in Aqaba, uh, Faisal expressed sympathy uh, to the Zionists. And I actually have a statement here uh, also by Faisal, um, who said, uh, who signed, signed the agreement, but he stated that, uh, as you know, he has, uh, I have a picture of it here. He has written it with his, uh, with his handwriting. This is his signature on the agreement, and he has written in Arabic, uh, with his own handwriting, uh, that as 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 long as um, if the Arabs are established, as I have asked in my manifesto of fourth of January fourth, addressed to the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, I will carry out what is written in this agreement. As as far as we you know our understanding with the British is going, then we have no problem with uh, welcoming our brothers to Palestine. Uh, those who are prosecuted, uh, the Jews who are prosecuted, they can come and they can establish their home in Palestine. It was not perceived as a political threat. Is that something that is inherent and in, in it was is, was it part of a plan or did Zionism change into a more uh, political phase? Which what I mean is, did Zionism have had no intention to establish a state, or it hid that purpose? I don't think that there was any any kind of hiding here. Uh, if there was hiding being done, it was being done by the British and the French. And as we uh, had discussed even uh, last time, given how fluid things were, it, it could be very easy uh, as an explanation to say that the British and the French had some master plan that had been drafted centuries ago, uh, and that now all of a sudden they found uh, the the opportunity to go ahead and carry that out. Uh, but clearly, as we've seen, I mean, even in in uh, that very excellent book, Blood and Sand, uh, you you can't help after reading that to to think that they were making it up as they went along. There were simply too many moving parts, and what we find then is whether or not there were people who were keeping track, keeping score, uh, did they falter by becoming a bit too trusting? Uh, there's a saying about uh, sometimes when you get too far over your skis, you then have the uh, potential to tumble over them. And I think that we see here that there, uh, there are clearly moments uh, on all the parts of all the major actors uh, that there were certainly promises that were made uh, some that were blatantly insincere uh, and others that perhaps uh, were naive uh, and they were also construed as being naive. For Faisal, he probably had a certain level of suspicion about the British, uh, perhaps the ambition that his father and his family had to get the Ottomans out of the area uh, 
uh, was perhaps primary. And the idea then of establishing a hereditary kingdom for themselves was secondary. And so in his dealings with Chaim Weizmann, a prominent British Zionist, uh, with whom he actually signed an agreement in 1919, he definitely shared with Weizmann a mistrust of the British. But he probably, it seems, also had a presumption that I think he truly believed that the British were still going to give him a kingdom. Uh, and the reason being is that in 1920, he then establishes for himself uh, the kingdom in Damascus, at which point the French came and kicked him off the throne. And as a consolation, the British then uh, coronated him the following year in, in Iraq. For the British Zionists, there was a mistrust all around. The bigger question, though, was between anti-Semitism and what I call philo-Semitism. Was the British establishment liking, were they friendly toward the Zionists, or were they just flat out being hateful and racist toward them and bigoted? And this was something that I actually believe you see played out in the Balfour Declaration and in the text. But there's another element that I think is also important for us to discuss. And the timing of the Balfour Declaration is by no coincidence. It is taking place after the Russian Revolution is happening. And remember, there are two revolutions, really. There's the February Revolution, which brings in a provisional government of Alexander Kerensky, and then the takeover by the Bolsheviks in the October Revolution with, with Vladimir Lenin and the ouster of uh, Tsar Nicholas II. There was a genuine uh, hysteria in the British establishment, as well as to a lesser degree, the American establishment, that Jews would see this as a moment to then migrate to, uh, to Russia, that they would see an opportunity, uh, because after all, Marx was of Jewish heritage, the uh, alleged inspirer of this revolution. Leon Trotsky uh, was Jewish, uh, a prominent deputy to Lenin. Uh, it was completely bogus. Uh, there was no call that, uh, that the Jews were going to uh, migrate to, uh, to Russia. But it was enough to certainly influence uh, the way that the British establishment saw it. Now, at the same time, much of the British establishment was in its own way Christian Zionist. Remember, from a from a religious standpoint, uh, according to Christian theology, uh, the Messiah, uh, Jesus, uh, will not return until all the Jews have returned to Zion. It is after that that they are then given the choice of either convert or be put to the sword, and near the end time, this is part of prophecy. Uh, at the same time, there is also then this kind of backhanded empathy that in order to have that, we need to be very sympathetic to the Jewish cause. But there was a transactional relationship between the Jewish community and the British establishment. Chaim Weizmann was a very prominent chemist who had uh, contributed greatly to the benefit of the British war effort by devising uh, a new form of military use acetone to clean the munitions out. His uh, district uh, where he lived in Manchester was represented by none other than uh, Arthur um, Balfour in uh, the parliament. Balfour had been prime minister, Balfour had been the Lord of the Admiralty, and now from 1916 uh, to 1919, he was the foreign minister. Uh, Balfour was a, a Zionist in the sense of being a Christian Zionist. The prime minister was Lloyd George, who was a uh, an unabashed Turkophobe. Uh, so he was looking for any way to undermine uh, the Ottomans. But there was also this nagging issue that was unresolved by Sykes-Picot that region which was supposed to be an international zone uh, between the Jordan uh, River and Mediterranean, there was still growing suspicion about the French designs in the area. And so a way to then sh uh, sort of uh, show cover for their paranoia about the French and appear to be rather magnanimous was to support self-determination for the Jewish people, but it wasn't really self-determination. It was to create then a situation of dependency. If you read the Balfour Declaration, it says that uh, His Majesty's government, George V's government, view in favor the establishment of a, a national homeland for the Jews, um, it being understood uh, 
that it will not prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and uh, political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So let's go ahead and dissect this. Are they creating a new sovereign state for Jews? Absolutely not. They are supporting it. That support, of course, is also ambiguous. We don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, even the mandate uh, system that came about later was probably not devised in the minds of the British and the French at the time because that came about thanks to the League of Nations and the League of Nations was not known until the Paris Peace Conference and it was something that was brought by uh, President Woodrow Wilson himself. It was certainly not within the imagination of the British and the French. So it's important to recognize that Balfour does not uh, create uh, a state of Israel. It does not create uh, even the, the initial steps of sovereignty for the state of Israel, much the same way symmetrically that the British said they supported an Arab kingdom, but they did not necessarily support a sovereign Arab country uh, for Sharif Hussein and his family. The second important clause that people don't consider is that there was a recognition by the British that they did not want instability and the Zionists also recognized this and appreciated it. Christians and Muslims, the non-Jewish communities of Palestine, were not going to be adversely affected by this. And then lastly, of course, was this very important and interesting clause that this will also not affect the rights and the status for Jews living elsewhere. There was a real anxiety by people like Lord Walter Rothschild, the recipient of the letter, a prominent member of the British Zionist community and a major financier of the war effort in Britain, and Chaim Weizmann and others, that this would be a pretext for the British to say, with our support for your homeland there, you can leave our homeland from here. And so that idea about whether this would leave to, lead to a kind of nudged deportation of Jews from Europe a kind of uh, polite cleansing, ethnic cleansing, was certainly on the minds of uh, the Zionist community, and they wanted to uh, ensure that that wasn't going to happen. Professor, in, uh, in 1939, the British government acknowledged that the local population's views should have been taken into account. And in 2017, just recently, they acknowledge that the declaration should have called for the protection of the Palestinian Arabs' uh, political rights. Uh, do you think that these are uh, sincere uh, acknowledgments by the British administration? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go ahead and, and get into the minds of the British. That's always dangerous. Uh, whether it's hindsight or regret being 2020, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that between them and, and, and their fate. But they technically had provided for that in the Balfour Declaration. So in that sense, I don't think that Balfour was deficient. I mean, after all, it is a very, very short letter, uh, as you've seen the text. The devil, as they say, is always in the detail, and the detail, of course, was how the British set up the mandate of Palestine. And uh, as you had mentioned his name before, Herbert Samuel, a prominent uh, a Zionist within the British government, uh, then becomes the first uh, high commissioner of the British mandate of Palestine, which, of course, uh, upset many of the Arabs because they felt as though he was not going to be impartial, that somehow or the other he might uh, favor uh, the Jewish community, favor Jewish migration, which, by the way, had uh, been uh, going on since the Ottoman time. The only time it was suspended was during the war itself. But uh, the first waves of Jewish migration to uh, Palestine started uh, under Abdul Hamid II uh, as the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in the same year as the pogroms began in, uh, in Russia in 1882. In the first wave of uh, 20 uh, years or so, uh, 35,000 Jews were let in from Russia and Ukraine uh, from the period then from 1904 to 1914, another 40,000 were let in. So this idea of Jewish migration being hostile to uh, Muslim or Ottoman uh, desires is simply not true. Uh, the uh, uh, the Ottomans allowed it to happen. Where they stopped, though, was when offers were made uh, 
by uh, uh, the, uh, the Jewish National Fund to essentially buy out land. Uh, and that is something that uh, Abdul Hamid II said, I, I cannot do, it's, it's not mine to give away or to sell. But the idea then that the policies that the British then implemented, it has to be understood that part of it was they simply perhaps were inept, uh, but part of it, cynically speaking, has to be understood to say that the longer they remained, uh, the better it was for them to push back on what the mandate had said, which was that as soon as this region develops its own ability for self-determination, that is when the mandate expires. Uh, the British were still highly worried about the stability and security of the Suez Canal. As oil was starting to be produced in uh, Mesopotamia, uh, it was just another reason to justify their prolonged uh, presence in the region. And so as a result of it, uh, perhaps there's no better way to justify uh, uh, being in a place than to uh, say that you have to be there in order to maintain order because the local populations are restive and in conflict with one another. How much the British then uh, uh, help to foment actively and provoke these uh, uh, conflicts between uh, Arabs and Jews uh, is of course a question of debate, uh, but they certainly created the climate by their presence uh, to allow these things to happen. Uh, Professor, I want to speak a little bit uh, in a uh, uh, compare and, and contrast uh, between the Arab revolt or the Arab effort for, for nationalism and the Jewish uh, effort for nationalism. Now, of course, there is, uh, there is two big differences. Uh, the Arabs were the occupants of uh, this general land. There is no uh, question or debate about their uh, right to the land uh, in general. And uh, uh, the Jewish, the Jewish had a, a much uh, d more difficult uh, project to, to to put together, and we saw throughout history how it was done, and uh, dependent on allying with uh, colonial forces and uh, heavy immigration, and then later on it turned into also some violent tactics. Um, <clears throat> when Hussein. Uh, when Sharif Hussein got the news, uh, the British, they sent David George uh, Hogarth uh, of the Arab Bureau in Cairo to meet Hussein between January 8 and January 14 in 1918. Uh, he delivered a solemn message from the British government that assured Hussein that Jewish, quote, Jewish settlement in Palestine would only be allowed in so far as would be consistent with the political and economic freedom of the Arab population, unquote. This unequivocal statement was finally sufficient to dispel Hussein's apprehensions about the ultimate intentions of the British government in Palestine. Messages went out to Faisal in Aqaba that he should not be too concerned with the implications of the Balfour Declaration now that he, Hussein, had received satisfactory clarifications from the British government that safeguarded Arab rights in that country, but that statement said, um, it, uh, that statement said, political and economic uh, freedom of the Arab population was that. That's a, a clear lie, right? I think it's a clear ambiguity. I mean, it's a statement yeah. that doesn't really state anything. Uh, what political and economic freedom really means, uh, it certainly doesn't explicitly say anything about sovereignty. The other thing that also uh, is, is, is a, a very open question is uh, whether Palestine was uh, part of the intended uh, or a, uh, acknowledged, uh, a mutually acknowledged uh, kingdom for Faisal uh, and, and Sharif Hussein and family. Because remember, uh, this statement is coming out in January of 1918. It's, ha uh, it's occurring uh, about five or six weeks after the Balfour Declaration has has uh, been enacted. But the Sykes-Picot Agreement of May of 2016 uh, clearly showed Palestine was an international zone, or put in another way, it clearly was not uh, within the, uh, the ideas and the aspirations of being part of an Arab kingdom. Now, we can go ahead and say charitably that the Sykes-Picot Agreement was going to uh, have 
zones of influence, uh, French zones and and British zones. But if uh, if Sharif Hussein thought that the entire region was going to be his kingdom, then why should zones of influence of his kingdom be split between the French and the British? So there's that issue that seems to be rather rather problematic. But the fact that he should have also noticed glaringly that uh, that Palestine was not uh, a zone other than an international condominium, as it was uh, referred to by Sykes-Picot, should have given him an indication uh, that it was in play. There doesn't really seem to be any correspondence, to my knowledge, between Sharif Hussein and uh, the British about the status of Palestine. Now, whether he took that on face value uh, when the British said, listen, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, uh, that would be, of course, a, uh, a spectacular failure on his uh, ability to, uh, to be suspicious. Or did he simply understand that Palestine was not supposed to be uh, an area um, that, that he was going to obtain anyway, or that he should just stay quiet because he should go for the bigger part of the pie as opposed to the smaller one. So Hogar's statement, it may not necessarily be intentionally uh, uh, duplicitous as much as it was left as the British uh, often did, whether it was with the Hussein McMahon correspondence uh, or other dealings, including Balfour, uh, ambiguous enough to give them wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Professor, uh, as, uh, let me divide this into two, uh, two uh, sections. One, the Arab perception, uh, it is, uh, you would agree with me that the, the, the Arab revolt and, uh, and the Arab political mind, which is basically was uh, the, the Arab al-Fatat, right? The, the Fatat organization, which Faisal was a secret member of. And uh, there is something that's intricate in history that, Faisal was trying to satisfy his father, but his mission was aligned with the Arab uh, Al-Fatat mission, which is the Arab nationalist movement. Um, the, uh, the Damascus Declaration of 1915, it clearly includes Palestine. And as far as the British is concerned, the only thing I can present to you is <clears throat> the uh, the correspondence of October 24, 1915, they say this is the most decisive document between McMahon and Sharif Hussein. Uh -huh. uh, although in the translation, sometimes uh, you know how they played with the translation, providing yeah. it a little bit more accurate in Arabic than in English. <clears throat> he said the districts of Mersin and Alexandrata and portions of Syria lying to the west of the districts of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo cannot be said to be purely Arab and must on that account be accepted from the proposed delimitations, subject to that modification and without prejudice to the treaties concluded between us and certain Arab chiefs, we accept that delimitation. As for the regions lying within the proposed frontiers in which Great Britain is free to act without detriment to interests of her ally France, I am authorized to give you the following pledges on behalf of the government of Great Britain and to reply as follows to your note. That subject to the modifications stated above, Great Britain is prepared to recognize and uphold the independence of the Arabs in all the regions lying within the frontiers proposed by the Sharif of Mecca. He has previously proposed it very uh, accurately, with the exceptions of Alexanderetta, Aden, and you know the areas that the uh, British had much interest. That yeah. that document kind of includes Palestine uh, very clearly in it, although you know there are things that are lost in translation sure. intentionally. Um, Professor, what man, there is ambiguity that time. I mean, the the Psychus Pico took place at the same time, almost uh, actually before uh, the uh, Belfort Declaration, but it hasn't been revealed till November of 1917, right? And by the time it, it got to the press and then the press got to Egypt and uh, and it got to the Arabs, it was way after the Balfour Declaration. Uh, do you feel that if it came before that, it would have had a different impact on, uh, on the Arab revolt? Absolutely. I mean, at the very least, there would have been a, uh, an opportunity to confront uh, the British uh, what would have occurred from that would have, of course, been, <clears throat> excuse me, quite embarrassing, as it turned out to be embarrassing, anyways. But it would have uh, arguably really changed the dynamics of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, the entire conflict, 
uh, it would have been difficult to imagine uh, that the Arab revolt would have continued. At the very least, it would have it would have been suspended, and who knows if the Ottomans would have been able to remobilize, reorganize, uh, and rearm uh, to stage a, uh, a a greater level of resistance against uh, against the British and the French forces uh, in the Syria campaign. Uh, it's it's one of those very very intriguing questions. But getting back to uh, the point about the Damascus Declaration, remember this is. Uh, October of 1915, and it just shows you how dynamic and how fluid the situations were. The Hussein MacMahon, uh, MacMahon correspondence was not concluded until March of 1916. So again, there was plenty of opportunity for uh, getting into a greater level of specificity and explicitness when it came to what were the terms of, of this correspondence. Now again, how much of that was based on um, uh, too much trust uh, that the Arab revolt, uh, that the Arab leaders had vis-a-vis -vis the British, uh, how much of it was really then a betrayal, uh, how much of it was uh, perhaps a little bit of cloudiness of uh, ambition that, hey, we might actually get a state or a kingdom. Uh, that kind of aspiration also uh, plays a, a big role. And then I think another point, as you mentioned before, about Arab nationalism, you had Futat uh, and you had the Damascus Declaration, but there was always going to be this issue uh, about uh, the fractures within, within the Arab uh, community. Muslim Arabs, by and large, were conflicted. Uh, do we go ahead and revolt against uh, the caliphate? That was, that was certainly something that created a, an equivocation. Christian Arabs might have had a bit of a different uh, perspective. Uh, they did not see uh, this as an issue about, uh, of course, revolting against the caliph. Uh, but at the same time, given the French and their patronage of Arab Christians, uh, including the establishment of the Mutasarafiya, that district along the Mediterranean, which then becomes uh, Lebanon, or the foundation for Lebanon, uh, there was always going to be these issues of, of unity uh, when it came to the notions of what exactly did Arab nationalism mean to the various elements of the Arab community. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> the British has stated in the Belfort Declaration, and then they changed it to the Jewish people because there was no such thing as a Jewish race, but they were perceived almost as a race. And then <clears throat> this concept was a new concept uh, that... Uh, uh, regardless of religion, uh, the culture, cultural Jew Judaism is itself an identity. And uh, do you feel that this can be contrasted to the Arab identity? I mean, seeing Arab identity not as a race, but as a cultural identity will mend all the differences within the Middle East uh, uh, between the Arab, uh, the, the different Arabs. It's, it's doubtful. And the reason being is that there are now such embedded lines of demarcation, many of these, of course, drafted and crafted by European powers, which have now become solidified over time. Yes, there's a certain kind of Arab cultural identity that exists. But at the same time, one could argue that the centers of gravity of that um, Arab identity have shifted. At one time, the Arab uh, identity and the center of gravity was uh, Egypt and Syria. Uh, now, arguably, that has shifted to the Gulf. Uh, and as a result of it, then we have to consider the economics uh, as also being a, a very critical factor. Will then uh, Arab identity uh, willingly accept uh, the shift to uh, a Khaliji essentialism or, or, or dominance? Uh, that's really hard to imagine that that can happen. And then what to say about uh, the, uh, the Arab uh, uh, culture of the Maghrib? Uh, I'm sure that they will also want to have some kind of representation uh, within that. But it's also an issue that arguably is within Jewish identity as well. And the idea that um, there are these debates, uh, there are in fact some under the surface, uh, and occasionally they, 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 they erupt, uh, conflicts within uh, the Jewish narrative of what is seen as the imposition of European or Ashkenazim uh, Judaism uh, to at the expense of uh, and at the inferiorization of the Sephardim, the Mizrahim, the Tamimi, and the the other Jewish communities. So identity politics is not something that is uh, the sole province and and the sole um, uh, calamity of, of of Arab identity, 
We're seeing that also uh, in some manifestations within uh, Jewish identity. The differences within Jewish identity is that uh, many of those issues are tabled in favor of the singular national identity of, of Israel. Uh, but as uh, as we're noticing even today, ideological differences are now starting to create new kinds of fissures uh, within Israel uh, to the point where the domestic political landscape has become uh, so fascinating that even uh, an Arab uh, party uh, is potentially now the linchpin of determining what the next uh, uh, government of Israel will look like. Yeah, and perhaps the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, the irony of ironies of, of yeah. that happening, isn't it? So uh, so I, I, I certainly would not want to be a member of the Knesset right now because I think there, it's, uh, it's just simply too chaotic. Uh, professor, the, it, it is certainly, uh, we, we probably will speak about that in a, in a later episode uh, about the, the Arab identity and uh, the possibility of... of uh, uh, united identity. I mean, after all, this is what this program is uh, is about: is to restudy it and re-examine it and re-question it. Uh, but to to come back to to that era of the of the Balfour Declaration, what do you feel that uh, the Arabs were had much more? Uh, um, let me say that they had much more uh, control of uh, their land and uh, and. Uh, at, in 1917, they were on the, uh, on the on the at the borders of Syria, and by 1918, they entered uh, Damascus, uh, while the British entered uh, Palestine, and they met both of them in Damascus, and they established the, the first Arab Congress, and they you know elected Faisal as a a crown with a uh, with a with a parliament. <clears throat> what what made the Arabs uh, so the, after from 1920? Till 1948, you have 28 years. Um, what what made the, uh, um, the 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 Zionist project uh, build so much stronger than the uh, Arab uh, national state, the national the national project, basically? Well, I think in part they understood the people who were the architects of the of the the Zionist project during the interwar period were ones who uh, seemed to have almost in intuitive and intimate knowledge of the way that the colonizers worked. Uh, after all, many of those architects were not in the British Mandate of Palestine. They were operating from London and from outside. And so they were privy to seeing how the mechanics uh, were playing themselves out, the evolution of the mandate project as a whole, and then trying to understand where their role was going to be within that. Uh, that is something that the Arab leaders uh, of, of their own aspiration for self-determination didn't have. They were on the ground. Uh, in fact, uh, one could even argue that being native uh, to the region uh, served uh, as as one of the disadvantages. Uh, for them, it was uh, about not having the kind of experience of understanding those who continue to go ahead and colonize them uh, during the interwar period. Uh, those who were the prominent British Zionists uh, went to school with uh, the establishment. They understood um, both the explicit language as well as the implicit language. Uh, they had a far longer history with them. Uh, and as a result of it, uh, they could perhaps catch the subtleties and the nuances of what was going on better than uh, the Arabs of the region could. Thank you, Professor. By that, we came to an end to this uh, episode. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, presence. We, I don't even provide you with the questions beforehand, but uh, uh, your answers are very sharp and eloquent. So that makes me... Uh, want to go back to uh, Wayne State and uh, take some of your classes. <laughs> You're welcome anytime. And actually, I mean, I prefer this. Uh, first of all, your questions are spot on. And uh, I, I find it better than to feel as though, uh, uh, especially for the audience, uh, for them to think that we're reading off a script. It's, it's nice to have that kind of uh, vibrancy. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. We hope to see you on upcoming episodes. This is, uh, I have a uh, 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 
a program that will last till the end of 2022. So we hope to see you in a few uh, upcoming episodes. Um, That'd be Ramadan, great. Ramadan Kareem again, uh, we'll Professor, you and we'll see you again. Okay, you. take care of yourself. Thank you for, for the audience. This episode will be available also on uh, podcast, on Spotify and all the other podcast uh, forms. Just look for uh, Dearborn Blog or for uh, Arab Identity and you will find it. Thank you, Professor. Good night, everyone. Good night.